Okay, let's get started. Thank you for, for being here and uh, listening to this talk called Designing for Humans. My name is Marcus. I work on Cello and I want to talk a bit about our research insights we gathered across the world when, when working on Cello. And since we're here at DeFi Summit, many of you probably work on decentralized apps or dApps and think about very different stakeholders um, for, for your apps. And um, as a team, uh, we had users in mind in many different emerging markets and developing countries. And we wanted to share with you some of our research findings from research trips across the world in Tanzania, Colombia, Argentina, Mexico, the Philippines, and Kenya. Um, but before we start, um, maybe also just a big bit of background on, on Cello and why uh, user research was very important when, when we designed uh, Cello. So in general, um, with doing user research, you want to understand the impact of your design, of your, of your app, of your dApp, of your protocol on, on different audiences. Let's see. Doesn't react anymore. <laughs> okay. Um, and the big question is, um, like, who will be the future users of your product, of your dApp, of your protocol? Who will be the future users? And why did we care to travel across the world and talk to people in many different emerging markets, developing countries, um, outside our local communities? If you're here in London, for example, and want to buy a beer and don't carry around cash with you, there are debit cards. If you want to take out a microloan and uh, pay for even more beers, there are credit cards. And if you want to pay back uh, money to a friend, maybe for some beers of last night, there's PayPal or Venmo. So we typically here in London or in Berlin or in San Francisco or wherever you're based, uh, live in, in communities or in countries with pretty well-developed uh, banking services, pretty well-developed financial services, and relatively stable currencies. But across the globe, there are 1.6 billion people unbanked. Um, 3.5 billion people even don't have an active bank account, and 1.1 billion people don't have a government-issued ID. That means these people without a government-issued ID don't have the chance to, to get a bank account in future. And um, all these people don't have the ability to send money across distance or um, receive uh, money or st uh, store uh, currency safely or enter a financial contract, take out insurance, anything. Um, so uh, when we create a more decentralized crypto system, we, uh, financial system, we should also keep these users in mind um, that are actually benefiting the most from, from building these more decentralized systems. So a quick word on Cello and why user research matters so much when designing this platform. Cello is an open platform that makes financial tools accessible to anyone with a mobile phone. What does that mean? Open platform means uh, Cello is a permissionless open source blockchain. We just open sourced uh, a test net of the Cello protocol. Uh, the, the blockchain is EVM compatible. It's a proof of stake IBFT type of consensus mechanism. And financial tools means that we are actually thinking about current features of money, payment systems, and maybe also some new features. And furthermore, mobile phone means we're thinking about how can end user adoption be driven. And we think that end users probably will, will use these decentralized systems via a mobile phone. Many people in developing or emerging markets don't have high performance computers. And to actually use these more decentralized systems on a large scale, they probably would use it on a mobile phone. Therefore, 
everything um, built on top of Celo is designed for, for mobile use. When designing the protocol, you should be able to understand what, what your users want, the user journey. And you want to make sure that what you're building is very relevant for, the, for your users. And um, when we built Celo and we said we are building together with communities around the world, we quickly learned in doing that user research that we should build the full stack. Full stack, again, means on, on, on the base layer of this open protocol, we have a cryptographic network, our own blockchain, or the Celo's own blockchain with a proof of stake type of consens consensus. And then on top of it, for example, a stability protocol for stable coins issued by the platform. And stable currencies are, and access to stable currencies are probably very important for, for many users uh, in future. Part of this uh, contract layer on top of this open platform is also a lightweight identity protocol that maps phone numbers to cryptographic addresses on the network to facilitate UX. So it should be very, very easy in that protocol to also find other users out there. And you can, can do that on the Celo network by knowing the phone numbers of other users. And on top of that, we have an application layer. And a first app, which is an, developed on top of the Celo platform, is an app that makes it very easy to send and receive payments. But we also released now a SDK, which makes it very easy to build um, other apps on top of, of the Celo pl platform. And we also invite the community to think about apps to build on top of that. And I just want to mention two technological innovations that are very important for this, for the talk on user research um, out of these, um, because they actually came out of user research in the past. And these two innovations are one, that uh, on the Celo network, it's uh, possible to pay for gas in multiple currencies. And when we did user research, for example, in Colombia, people told us that they don't get the notion of paying a transaction in one currency and then paying for transaction fees in, uh, in another currency. Um, therefore, like getting this feedback from our users, we, for us it was crucial to build that into the Celo platform that you're able to pay in, in multiple currencies and you're able to pay for gas in the, in the same currency as uh, you're doing the transaction. And the second uh, technological innovation on the Celo platform is a decentralized phone PKI. I already also mentioned that. So this one maps hashes of phone numbers to public keys to facilitate user experience. So probably like um, in, in many countries around the world, they, uh, if they want to make a transaction, they don't know your, your public key on the network and you have, uh, you have to give also in non-custodial wallets the possibility to find new or other users. And uh, therefore, we, we built this in um, the Celo platform. But let's talk a bit more about the actual topic of this talk, the user research, and how you can do user research and maybe how you can also structure and organize user research. At least from our point of view, we want to share how, how we did it in the past. And um, when, we, when we did user research, most of the uh, current team members working on Celo um, joined. Um, and we, we did more than 150 user research interviews in seven different countries. As I mentioned, we, we traveled to, to Mexico, to the Philippines, to Colombia, to Argentina, uh, Kenya, and Tanzania. And we used different methods, mostly design research methods, uh, to talk uh, with, with uh, prospective users and, and get their view on how a product out of the decentralized finance space could help them in, in their daily life. I was actually part of a research trip to Colombia and for me that was the first time talking to unbanked people um, and this was a very interesting experience, especially when we were in Colombia, we were talking to migrants from Venezuela and they are basically recently unbanked. So they have been like had a banking relationship when they were living in, um, in um, Venezuela, 
um, but when they had to leave the country out of various reasons and came to Colombia, they didn't have the chance to get a bank account, so they are basically newly unbanked. Um, and uh, the uh, interview partners we, we uh, talked to there came from very different educational backgrounds. They also had very different financial literacy. Um, and um, I want to share some of these insights we, we gathered there. So basically, and this, like, especially here at DeFi Summit, this is probably nothing new. The crypto adoption, the actual adoption on a large scale for end user will be a journey. To get to that stage where people actually love uh, the, the dApps and apps and protocols out there, it takes different steps. And I want to tell you about these four steps here we thought that were very important for us um, when we are doing this research to think about like in this framework. So the first step is actually in a, in a country where all of this is new, where there are varying degrees of financial li literacy and for sure varying degrees of knowledge about blockchain or, or our industry we all work in, um, you have to raise awareness and talk a lot about what you're doing. And you have to get people to understand what you want to solve, what problem you're solving for, and then you have to build trust. And there are nice examples out there which were very successful to build trust, um, but there are also some counterexamples I want to talk about. And then in the end, it has to have some value for the prospective user so that they actually will, will use it. And uh, yeah, I will talk a bit about the, these uh, yeah steps in this journey. And let's start with uh, awareness. So, for example, we did user research in Kenya. And Kenya is a very interesting country for user research on the, in the decentralized finance space. Kenya is a country with around 50 million people, and 40% of the population are under the age of 15. So, in contrast to many of the countries here in Europe, um, the, the, the population is younger, but also has a very high pover poverty rate. The poverty rate in Kenya is 36% of the population. Um, they live under two, under two dollars a day. But also Kenya has a very high mobile penetration. 88% uh, of people have mobile phones in, in Kenya, and 86% actually use mobile money. So for building a mobile-first cryptocurrency, Kenya is, is a good place to start to talk to users. And when we talked, for example, to this Kenyan businesswoman, she said, I've not put into my head to know what Facebook is for. So in her case, for her, like her daily life, Facebook is not actually solving any kind of need. She uses products from Facebook, she, for example, uses WhatsApp, since she can understand that she can, using uh, WhatsApp, uh, communicate with people, but she doesn't get the sense or the, the, the value add from, from a social network. So people many times don't spend any time about new concepts, the new concept of, for example, a social network. Um, they put everything like we, we bring there like into their existing frameworks. And when M-Pesa started in Kenya, this was really, really interesting. M-Pesa was introduced as send and receive money in the air. And this is something people in Kenya could relate to. They had to send money across distance before, and they typically used uh, some agents or uh, send money home via taking the bus themselves. So for them, sending money across distance was very, very difficult. And then when M-Pesa um, had this promotion, send and receive money in the air, this was actually uh, a, a need they had before, and then uh, M-Pesa got the attention of the people. So one first solution around awareness, which is very important, is that your messaging when you develop an app or dApp should be uh, speak to the need of, of your prospective users. And even though, for example, M-Pesa in Kenya is not 
cheap. So there's still fees up to 20% for, for a transaction. This is something which uh, solved a real, real need. And I think the decentralized space can, can help there even more. Um, fees are typically much lower. Um, so if you speak to people's need, they probably would listen. The second phase I was, was mentioning earlier is uh, understanding. And uh, when we did uh, research in Colombia and Argentina, uh, we, we heard many different stories about understanding of these new systems and decentralized finance and finance in general. So especially in Argentina, people are checking um, the FX rate of uh, pesos to the dollar every day. It's almost a hobby. Because they live with hyperinflation since decades now, and uh, for people it's very important to know about the value of their savings or, or local currency on, on a daily basis. However, many people there don't get the notion of investing. Since they have to meet their basic daily needs, investing is nothing they really care about. So in, in, in Argentina, people wouldn't get the concept of a currency for investing or even a cryptocurrency for investing and a cryptocurrency for, for transactions. Especially there, the most basic need has to be met and it has to be one, a stable currency and two, very easy to, to transfer. So, um, understanding means people put new concepts into existing frameworks. So when we're talking, for example, also to people in Argentina or Colombia about uh, cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and other currencies, then they put this into existing frameworks. They heard before about the Petro. When the Argentinian government introduced the Petro, um, a cryptocurrency pact, to, to oil um, in the country, people actually informed themselves about Bitcoin and put this into the concept they heard. And uh, on the picture here down on the right, you see a jar of peas, and this was actually from doing research, user research in a refugee camp in Tanzania. And uh, people were telling us, um, it's very hard for them to do like certain type of transactions since they don't have a currency there. And if, for example, someone fixes your roof, you want to pay with something so that they can maybe even get some other service. And they currently actually use in this refugee camp we visited together with the World Food Program of the United Nations. They use peace there because they are like easily countable, storable, and uh, everything they hear about new like currencies or new financial systems, they put this in the existing concept and the existing framework they, they know about. The next story is about trust. And this is also a story from a migrant from Venezuela. And when we were talking to him, he says um, when he wants to do a financial transaction and goes to his guy, he has a table out front of his house, he has a Venezuelan flag, there's some traditional music playing, he always gets a coffee and has a chat. So when he wants to send money back home, he trusts this person that the money actually arrives. A different story about um, the transaction fees for this transfer. In this case, the person even didn't know about the transaction fees because they were buried somewhere in the exchange rate. But um, for, this, for this person, it was very, very important to have a face um, for doing this transaction. And it's much harder for people to trust a faceless organization than a real person. With a real person, you, can, you know where to go when there's a problem. And stories about bad experiences travel really, really fast. So if you have a bad experience with an agent like this, then the story probably can be um, yeah, blamed at the person level. If it's basically a story about the brand, this can hurt the brand very, very quick. So in decentralization, it is very important to still have basically a face to what you're doing. So in, in, in the case of uh, Safaricom and uh, M-Pesa in Kenya, and Safaricom is the owner of M-Pesa, 
um, people actually trust M-Pesa because there are M-Pesa agents everywhere and uh, they can go to an agent if something goes wrong. But people hate Safaricom. And also the distrust of like banks as a corporation was very common in Mexico and Venezuela and Argentina. So as I said, people trust people, not organizations. And this is, I think, also very important when designing a decentralized protocol that you have to keep in mind that there should be some like personal touch and feel to it. In, in our example, designing a decentralized protocol, this is rather difficult. But on the other hand, um, we redesigned, for example, the Cello website to, to have heavy photos on there. We really want to put a face out there. And we also will focus in certain countries in, in different pilot projects on in-person cash-in and cash-out solutions. Especially when developing for these markets, you cannot expect uh, people to go to an exchange um, I think these in-person contacts are still very important. And then finally, value. You actually have to think about the value add you provide to, to people in these countries. Um, and in Tanzania, for example, um, in the refugee camp we were, and also in the neighboring town, the network goes down when it rains. So every time when it rains a bit, you don't have internet access anymore. You can't even make a call then. Or in Kenya, for example, we, we observed that every phone people had was uh, set to uh, very low brightness to save battery. Um, and most people use Bluetooth to also save on data. So when developing for these markets where, where other resources are very, very scarce, you have to keep these things in mind. Um, developing a decentralized app um, which is targeted towards uh, an emerging country should be very, very energy efficient um, and also should be able to work when, when there's low, low internet. The download speed, for example, in the Philippines ranged from 3 megabytes per second to 12 megabytes per second. And like within that range, that fluctuated widely. So there's more to consider when designing for low resource settings. And some, sometimes the solution can be easy. So when we did a pilot bro uh, project in, in, in Argentina, we actually put um, to the stores accepting cello dollar or cello currency. We just put a, a um, code that people could scan. Even if at the time they want to do a transaction, they don't have internet access, they can scan the code and make the transaction maybe uh, some minutes later. So sometimes there are uh, easier solutions, and other times there are more difficult solutions. But for example, energy efficiency for, for your solutions you're developing is probably very critical. In some, some um, countries in, in Kenya, um, people uh, could charge their phone once a week. And uh, this day was like basically when in that village we were, it's like someone with a bike came by. On the back of the bike, there was a huge battery pack. And then people could go there, pay this person, and then charge their phones. So their energy efficiency is, is highly critical. So those are some like in-market stories on, on crypto adoption. People won't pay attention unless you speak to their need. I think this is, this is very clear. And like when designing a decentralized protocol, you want to get the incentive right. But you also want to get the incentives right uh, with your end users in mind. People put new concepts into existing frameworks. I think this understanding, this works for us here, and this works across the world that uh, people also will put your, your app into the existing frameworks they have around investing or, or, or loans or anything. People trust people, not organizations. I think this is very important. And building a decentralized world, this is actually good news um, since uh, we are not, not building huge organizations. So this is probably good news for trust. And then in the end, uh, there's more to consider when designing for le low resource settings. For us, the most important thing we, we learned in Kenya was the energy efficiency and also um, anything around, uh, for example, connection. So 
everything I said about the design guidelines, we, we applied designing um, and working on Cello. Um, maybe here, maybe three things you can, can take home when, when designing your solution. Um, you should speak the user's language. It's also like always very important. Um, and uh, don't assume the user have the same um, financial literacy or blockchain literacy you have. You should put a face to it. It makes it easier for people to trust you. And uh, you should design for core usability considerations. The vision of Salot for like a better and more prosperous world is very ambitious and we realized we cannot work on this alone. So we really in want to invite the community to get involved. If you're interested to get involved, this is uh, an offer of uh, many different ways to, to interact also with uh, the Salot uh, platform. So you can contribute to the code base. Um, here's a GitHub link. We just open sourced the Salot testnet. Um, and want to open source also mainnet towards end of this year. Um, you already can test and run a node, a validator or full node, and we have uh, many like docs explaining how to do that online as well. You can propose a project um, for a fellowship and, and receive some funding, for example, for a research fellowship and, and help with user research in these markets I just uh, described. Um, we are also always happy when, when someone wants to host a meetup. Um, and uh, for sure, we're looking for, for people joining the Cello family. And uh, yeah, here's also our jobs page. Another maybe interesting thing here at DeFi Summit would be if you're building decentralized apps, decentralized finance apps, uh, Polychain announced the Cello Ecosystem Fund, so um, A16Z and Polychain Capital and Cello would invest in projects that want to build on top of the Cello platform. As I said, it's an open and permissionless platform, so um, the, the code is open source and we have our SDK online um, where you can, can have uh, yeah, easy examples also for apps um, on top of the Cello platform and um, yeah, maybe even get funding for this. Yeah, and that's uh, it. Um, feel free to, to ask anything about this. I hope I, I sparked some interest in doing user research. And uh, thank you very much for, for your time. You. Yeah, sure. Hi. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. I wanted to ask you how will you manage liquidity? Like imagine someone sends money from Kenya to Venezuela or like in cities. How actually will you manage the liquidity? So the liquidity on like yeah, it's an it's an open platform. There will be different currencies on this platform. There will be, as I said, there's a stability protocol involved and sending money from one country to another can be, for example, in stablecoin. Um, the stability protocol around, stable, uh, around the stablecoin is designed so that um, the supply of stablecoin is always adjusted to demand of stablecoin. So if um, there's more demand uh, of stablecoin, then the, the protocol will issue more. And then there's also um, a, a mechanism to contract the demand of uh, stablecoin out there to basically reduce liquidity. Apart from that, there's not, not, not really liquidity management of the protocol of like different currencies in country. All liquidity is managed so that basically the price of stablecoin is always stable. Does it answer? Okay. So in, yeah, that, and this is probably like a different problem in the beginning of this and in the beginning to actually get 
currency to market, get cryptocurrency to market, we work with different pilot projects. So for example, with partners like the uh, World Food Program of the United Nations or Give Directly, we work in different countries uh, where they help us to basically get stablecoin there and then um, also set up some agents who, who are basically changing um, from stablecoin into fiat and also set up stores that accept currency. So that is like a first, first part which will be doing pilot projects. But we currently also work, for example, with uh, mobile providers who can also help um, to be like on and off ramps. And basically any other on and off ramp you can imagine, um, like also traditional exchanges, but yeah, especially in, in emerging markets, probably exchanges is, is a difficult way. Sure. Thank you, guys. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you.